Um, so welcome everybody. Welcome folks joining in. Uh, this is a question and answer session all about the course. Uh, I'm someone who's been really lucky to learn from a lot of the water heroes around the world, Seth Holzer, Virginia Dressing, and doing this work around the world, I've seen that there's just crazy demand for it, really more demand than one person. It really needs hundreds, thousands, or maybe even millions of people doing this type of water restoration work. And so after a decade of working in the field, I developed this core course program to really train others to bring them through the experience that I had in order to get to where I am today in a very condensed period of time. So it's essentially distilling down all the essentials of what I do, how I do it, in terms of helping harmonize people with their landscape. Um, and so without uh, any more, we can get right into your guys' questions. So you can ask questions using the question and answer feature. Uh, you can put it right into the chat or you can raise your hand and ask your question uh, with your voice, which I'd love to hear from some of you all joining today. Um, yeah, the course has these three different pathways, professional, steward, and advocate that really all have the same information for the course, uh, but they're different required actions in terms of receiving certification. Uh, so we're requiring different things of people who want a professional certification um, versus a land steward. This is a pretty big change, usually, whether you want to do this work for others or mainly do this work for yourself or on a specific individual landscape. Then we also have the advocate pathway, which is really for people that want to be a community leader. They want to help raise awareness about water cycle restoration and what is possible but they don't necessarily have access to land. They can't implement all of the things that we're asking these people um, on the higher levels of certification to do. And so that advocate level makes it possible for someone in the city to join, someone without any land access. Um, are you affiliated with the university? No, we are not affiliated with the university. Um, our certification, really means something because it comes from people who know how to do these things. Um, for one, not being affiliated with the university allows us to speak freely as far as water privatization and some of the different issues that usually big universities can't speak directly towards because of where some of their funding comes from. Um, but then additionally, we're really trying to offer in ways an alternative pathway to universities. Uh, someone who, uh, such as myself, who went to university seeking answers, I got nothing but more questions and more details on how everything is screwed up. Uh, and frankly, you know, I learned some fancy words, but I didn't really learn anything that I use on a daily basis. Whereas in contrast, what I learned from an unschooled farmer, Sepp Holzer, um, a doctor who ended up working in land, Rajendra Singh, these are really the things that deliver results on the landscape. Um, so we're really trying to offer something that provides real solutions for people going to university and environmental science or sustainable agriculture. A lot of times you're not really learning the solutions that we need on the landscape. And so this program is designed specifically to supply such. Um, what questions have we got from folks that are joining today? Uh, you can enter it in the chat, enter it in the question and answer, raise your hand uh, and ask it with your voice. Uh, another question, I've completed an Oregon State University PDC. Is your course structured online like a PDC, i.e. using a student site for a practicum? Um, so this course is online and at home. And really most of the learning that you're going to gain from this course is at home because whereas and in many ways I developed this course out of um, to some extent my frustration with the PDC. Now a PDC is a great introductory course but it's really a professional certification built around an introductory course and I've seen so many people get out of a PDC and not really know what to do or how to do it uh, they have a bunch of ideas and they have a bunch of words of things that 
they've heard work, um, but then when you see what's implemented, it usually isn't very desirable. It usually doesn't often achieve the results that people are seeking to actually achieve. And so our course is very practice based. You're going to have to go outside in a rainstorm. You're going to dig test slices. You're going to feel with your hand the different types of soil. You're going to build models. You're going to build water bodies. Uh, you're going to read landscapes. You're going to learn about yourself. You're going to learn about your watershed. Um, so it's very, very different from a PDC. Um, it's really condensed lectures uh, that are delivered as videos that are pretty high quality and easy to watch videos. Uh, and then it's a workbook of at-home activities, which you're gonna do. Uh, now, in addition to that, we also have bonus videos about specific projects or things like that. Uh, and we also have these live office hours. These office hours are really key with each module for getting your questions about that module answered, learning more about your specific situation or your site, um, and really learning from the other students in the class as well. So I know for a lot of people who've joined our previous round, that was what they got the most out of was these live office hours that happen every other week as part of each module throughout the course. Um, so it's really, you're able to participate wherever you are. You don't have to travel in order to do this course. Um, it is online, but most of the learning is at home out on the landscape from all the things you'll be required to do as part of doing this course. Other questions from folks? Uh, you can, oh, a few popping in the question answer. Um, I have multiple earthworks projects I would like to complete on my property. Can I share these projects as we move through the class for input, feedback, et cetera? Absolutely. And in fact, you will essentially be required to uh, if you're on either the steward or professional level. Um, and so this is there's two ways that you can really get specific feedback. Actually, three ways you can get specific feedback about your projects. Um, one being presenting it in the live office hours. Uh, assuming it relates to the module at hand or the focus of that office hour at hand, um, actually presenting your project to the class. Uh, the other is in the workbook where you're receiving individualized feedback from me based on your actions, based on what you're doing for each module. Um, and then the third is by sharing it to the community, all the people in the previous version of the course and all the people in this current version of the course uh, we have a private community space within the Water Stories community uh, where you can constantly share your projects for input, feedback, all of those kinds of things. Um, so this is a really good way to learn more about your course, or sorry, learn more about your project, um, to help move through your projects with some expert feedback, um, to avoid a lot of issues and errors, and really to improve the effectiveness of what you're doing. Uh, so it, it sounds like this would be a great fit for you because not only would you be allowed to, but you would actually be required to share a lot about your own projects. Um, looking at the course materials, I saw things about sit spots and journaling and meditation and observation. And obviously these are all very important things, but I didn't yet see where we learn the more specific skills, like how to analyze the clay content of soil, how to calculate the dimensions of a water body, how to build the keyway, uh, when to use what type of heavy machinery, et cetera. When does this come into the course and how big of a role does it play? Um, so it comes into the, I mean, it plays a huge role as far as implementing this uh, work on the ground. A lot of it co that comes in in module five, action, reaction, and ripple effects. This is actually everything from uh, you know, when to use different types of equipment, what types of equipment to use, how to judge the moisture content, how to judge the clay content. Um, some of this is covered right up front with reading land uh, in the form of <laughs> taking test slices, performing hand texturing, performing mason jar tests, understanding the portion of clay, sand, silt, and clay within your soil. Um, and then a lot... Most of these details are in module five, but really 
there's some underlying structural things that need to be understood in order to be able to do those kinds of things in the right area. So the first part of the course, it starts out with reading the land, really starting to understand where and how to read the land, um, and then some of the possibilities for water cycle restoration. Then moving into the second phase of the course, it's learning about how to read all of the specific types of life within the land. Uh, and then it really gets into how to create actions, where those actions should be, how big they should be, um, all of those kinds of details. There's lots of animations to help understand things like where to place a dam within a valley, um, where the ideal places are, how to assess the value of different areas for water retention features. Um, and then even, you know, how to use an excavator, a basic excavator 101, how to use laser levels, uh, those kinds of things come into play with module six. Um, so it does play a very big role. And then with the fourth phase of the course, it really gets into how to estimate projects, uh, how to set up working relationships, um, you know, whether ownership and things like that, as far as equipment is something that you should be considering. Uh, so it, the course really breaks things out based on where you are within a very chartered experience to move through essentially five years of my development as a water restoration practitioner in a condensed six month timeline. Um, so a lot of those things as far as equipment, how to build a keyway. You know, for example, we have bonus videos on the actual process of building a keyway, which equipment I like to use, um, how to judge that the moisture, what too wet looks like, what too dry looks like, um, all of those kinds of things. So it very much comes into play in the middle of the course. And then again, at the end of the course, building on that knowledge, as far as how to then make a business around these things. Um, I'm currently in the process of purchasing land, but live in an urban area now. Can I still fully and successfully participate in this course? Uh, so with the advocate pathway, you can participate in this course without any land access. Now, in order to do the professional and steward pathway, we are requiring you to build a rain garden, build a water body. You will need some access to land where you can make some permanent interventions. Um, now, this could be a schoolyard, this could be a park, this could be some abandoned lot. Uh, it doesn't need to be large, it doesn't need to be fancy, but it needs some to be some place for you to enact change on the earth. Uh, but with this advocate pathway, that is for someone in a high rise, so that requires none of those actions. Um, it does require you to be a little bit more of a, a point of contact within your community because as city dwellers, city dwellers have unfair access to the governance around the world. Um, so it's really important that for people living in cities, you act as a voice for the voiceless and really bring this story of water to those places. Um, Uh, when you work on a project that requires permitting, do you address that? Um, so yes, certainly. This is something we go into uh, throughout the course. Now, I'll say it by no means is my expertise or specialty. Um, I basically always outsource the permitting process, um, especially working in different countries around the world. Um, but this is something that I basically go through the different strategies that you could take partake in something like this. I call it the yin and the yang of project permitting. Uh, but basically there's different strategies you can implement, different ones make sense for different times. And I basically unfold all of that as far as here's the different approaches. This has value in these ways, this has value in these ways, uh, so that you can really help guide your clients through that process. Whether it's you yourself taking on that process as a landowner, um, or whether you're helping a client understand what kind of permits they need for the projects that you're proposing. Uh, we definitely help 
guide people through that and give a good firm foundation, but you will very much then need to look into the details for your own location. So I don't give, you know, which permits are required within any given location. I paint a picture of what is basically there around the world as far as the different ways that it might be. Um, and then it's very much up for you to then look into the specific details. Uh, now, we do very much provide clear ways as far as how to get projects approved more easily, what to call them, what not to call them. Um, all of those kinds of details we absolutely get into, but not that you will need permit 517 for uh, an earthen burn, um, for example, in the state of Oregon or, or whatever that specific permitting detail is. Uh, great question so far. Keep them coming in, folks. Um, living in the Netherlands, uh, most of the landscape is inverted below sea level. Does the course also cover these types of landscapes and their specific challenges? Um, so we a little bit go into um, the coastal effects and freshwater lenses and things of that nature. Uh, but really, I'd say, you know, I very much try not to provide a recipe book at all. And what we instead provide is an approach, a way to look at the landscape, a way to understand how the landscape has been changed over time. Um, so this approach I find works anywhere, whether you have too much or too little water, uh, the different situations that I've encountered this approach of learning from the landscape, learning how to read the landscape, understanding the ecological potential within that landscape, and then creatively maximizing it, that works regardless of where you are. Um, so I do think that the course has a lot of value for people in a landscape like where you are, uh, which is very different from a lot of landscapes around the world. Um, and, but this is also why we have the live office hours. Because uh, situations like this, rare situations, are oftentimes a great learning point as well for the other people in the course. And so during these live office hours, you can present more specific situations like this. Um, and like, for example, I just worked on a project uh, similar to what you're describing, uh, though, in Italy, uh, where it's below sea level and from the historical land management uh, and the systems they have put in place, they now have basically a, a landscape that is solidifying uh, and the landscape is really struggling to produce as a result and it's in a place where you know they're making very little money per hectare most of the money they make is from subsidies uh, but they should have an incredibly productive farm because ecologically that landscape is incredibly incredible potential um, so you know, it's not going to teach you a recipe book and just follow this, this, and this to do this. It's actually going to teach you more of a way to think, a way to think about the landscape and a way to work with the landscape. Um, so I do think it would be applicable for you. Um, my intention is to create a food forest with swales and or terraces with multiple water bodies. Do we get into types of trees and plants that can, should be planted for projects like this? Um, so this is definitely something that, uh, you know, in we have a whole module dedicated to our relations. And so that's the different ways that we can work with uh, the plants, the animals, the fungi, all of the different relatives that we have. Um, so again, I'm not going to give you a recipe book as far as plant these things in this pattern, because um, in my experience, there is no recipe book that works. There's rather a strategy that is very effective from working with the landscape. So we 100% go into that strategy. Um, and again, this is something where, you know, if you have specific things in mind, you can present it at the office hours or you can post it in the community and get specific feedback on that. Um, but it is not going to be a recipe book on syntropic agriculture or things like that. Um, there's, there's lots of good sources for those kinds of things already. So we're really focusing on that way to look at the landscape and that way to work with plants and animals and the different relations uh, that we have. Um, uh, 
Oh, that's very interesting. The uh, urban forest restoration with stormwater management. Um, yeah, that type of thing is brilliant and desperately needed. Um, uh, question from my PDC. I'm interested in more detail on converting clay silt into usable fertile soil. Uh, it doesn't hydrate very well without amendments. Um, so this is, again, you know, it's not going to have a specific recipe for you, given your soil type, but it is going to teach you the different techniques you could do to aerate the soil, the different ways that you could get water better entering into that soil. Um, so it's really going to teach you to look at how water is moving through the landscape and then to make interventions based on those observations. Um, so it's, you know, I found specifically with landscapes, every landscape is so unique. It has such unique potential that there really is no one size fits all solution. Um, so, you know, working in those types of clay soils, it's a lot of our projects. Uh, there's huge potential to open up those soils, to get them really hydrated. Clay soil, I think, has the most potential out there. It has the highest cation exchange capacity, highest water holding capacity. Uh, it's just the most easy to be abused. And so it can very easily get waterlogged. It can very easily get compacted. Um, but by working with the plants, working with the soil bacteria and fungi, um, and then by restructuring the land when and where necessary, you can really get that soil to come to life. Uh, does the course provide any guidance on how to regenerate the water table in arid metropolitan areas like Las Vegas? Um, so yes, it definitely goes into, I think this is one of the things the course does really well is how to recharge the water table. Um, now there are specific issues around urban areas, uh, and I think in some ways this really entails looking at the landscape a little more broadly, not necessarily doing all of the interventions immediately in um, the metropolitan areas, but maybe the areas surrounding. But this is something we definitely go into in quite some detail throughout the course um, in a number of different places. And I think it's one of the big things is really just starting to look at the Department of Transportation is the Department of Transportation and Water Infiltration. Uh, and so if the roadways and networks around these metropolitan areas all had water infiltration as part of them, that could do a lot to really start recharge, recharging groundwater tables uh, in metropolitan areas. There are also some examples of uh, larger cities taking all the stormwater waste and then moving that into infiltration basins. And so that has done the same thing as well. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that we go into uh, as part of the course overall. Um, regarding the module R relations, uh, what will we learn in this module? How specific will the module be about different species? Uh, will you talk about individual species or in general terms? Can you give a few examples of what you will learn and what kind of exercises we do in that module? Um, so it's going to be um, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of dialed in and a little bit of zoomed out. Um, so it's going to look at plants, how to read plants. For example, you know, it's going to do this for each one of our relatives, but just to give an example for plants, it's going to read how to understand the different types of soil deficiencies in the ground from the leaf pattern and where the leaf pattern is changing based on the plants. Uh, it's going to teach you how to read wind, how to read sun, how to read bad exposure during weather events. Um, it's going to basically teach you how to how to work with each one of these, how to learn from, understand, and then work with each one of these relatives that we have. So whether it's the plants, whether it's the earth, whether it's the unseen relatives that we have, whether it's the human relatives that we have, and essentially how to take that interaction, learn what you need to, to creatively engage with it, and then put it in a position to do even better as a function of your engagement with it. Um, so for example, it might be 
looking at a plant to understand the environmental conditions, to then be able to plant a plant where it will have the best chance to thrive given the environmental conditions. Um, so it will go very much into specific plants in some cases, but it'll also be focused more on patterns and approaches uh, and really overall a pattern and a strategy to learn from all of these different relatives. I consider water a relative as well. So how to read the different indications that water leaves, how to read where water levels were at past points in time, uh, just by the trails and tracks that it leaves on the landscape. Um, so this module really goes into, you know, how to learn from and then engage with uh, each one of those relatives that we have. Um, what's the typical weekly time commitment? Um, so this changes a little bit from module to module, uh, but generally I think that you should allow five to 20 hours per module. And so that's every other week uh, allowing. So I think you need to allow at least two hours a week. And if you really wanna get maximum value out of the course and maximum development of yourself as a water restoration practitioner during the course, I think you should plan on spending more like five to 20 hours per week. Um, well, there's gonna be a lot of things that you have to do to a little extent, but if you really want to move forward quickly, you should do a lot. Uh, so for example, something like building the water body. Now you can go out and build a water body with a shovel. And as long as you do it right and do the right things, that's gonna complete that action. Um, but we've had students who, you know, built an awesome swimming pond for their whole community as part of that action. Uh, now that probably took them 60 hours of work um, so it you know a lot of it is and now as a result of them doing that project they have clients asking them to do projects for other people uh, so I think to get maximum value out of the course 10 to 20 hours per week uh, then you're really going to move forward as a practitioner as a result of doing this course um, as far as completing the course I think you need two and a half to 10 hours, um, really two and a half to five hours uh, per week. And if you wanna do the bare minimum, I mean, it's really usually about two hours of video content per module. Uh, and then, you know, maybe another five hours or four hours for the actions um, each week. So, and that's every other week that a new module is released. So you could, at a bare minimum, do it with um, maybe about two to four hours per week. Um, can you also give an example of what kinds of projects will be completed for the course that require land access? So I can gauge how much space, how often uh, we need to be on it. Um, I just already know that this is an excellent course and need to get that piece in place. Um, so, as I mentioned, the advocate level does allow you to do the course without that land access, um, but as far as the land access, there's a lot of pieces where you need land access that you don't need, you just need access to walk on it. Um, there's a lot of land reading, property assessment, things of that nature that you could do in a public park, you could do in all sorts of places. Now, when we get to module five, this is where there's some real actions required where you're making things on the landscape. Um, so one is uh, building a rain, first building a model. So this is making a small model. You know, this could be the size of a tabletop. Uh, next is creating a rain garden. Again, this doesn't need to be very large. It could be the size of a vehicle or even smaller than that. Um, then a water body. Uh, you also need, you know, it could, these things can be done with a shovel. Um, they don't need to be large by any means, but they need to be put in the right place. Uh, so given, you know, you could have a suburban yard um, and that would be plenty of space for all of these actions. 
Um, but you do need some piece of land to be able to make a space where water will collect um, and make some models with earthen material and dig some holes in the ground and feel the soil. Um, so that it is something you will need for the steward and professional pathways. Uh, hello, I'm from Iran. Uh, and as you know, the Iran is a sub-desert country. So in ancient times, uh, we save water in uh, Kanat and Cistern. Uh, but in this area, the government doesn't pay attention to save it as our ancestors did. So what should we do? Um, oh, aqueduct, thank you for that detail. Um, uh, you know, I think you, you're really looking at something similar to what Rajendra is working with in India, uh, where it's really just a matter of holding the soil in the ground, feeding it into the ground. Um, you know, it's a place that used to be rich and has since changed a lot. Uh, and also the Al-Beta project would be something to look into in Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, they can certainly be done uh, and really it can be done by the people. It doesn't need to be, you don't need to wait for the government. Uh, the people themselves, ourselves can implement these kinds of changes um, just by working with the land, holding the water in the land. Um, and it's really, I mean, amazingly simple when you start doing it. Um, how are assignments completed and submitted? So we have a workbook, uh, which is essentially a place where you have all of your actions in one place within the app. Um, so we have a custom built app for the course uh, that's constantly being developed and improved as well. And within that, you have the videos for the course that you can watch either laptop, desktop, on your phone, however you like. Um, and so it's an online workbook where you basically get the videos for your different actions. A lot of times there will be details or links or things to help facilitate those actions. Uh, and then your the actual work is going to be done out on the landscape. Uh, but then essentially after doing said work, you share a couple of pictures, write some details about what you did. Uh, you basically follow the prompts in the online workbook to submit the details to show what you did, how you did it, and also give enough information for me to give feedback on so that I can see the rain garden that you built and say, oh, that looks good, but this piece needs to be a little different and watch out, this might have issues in a big rain event. Um, so that essentially we can help move you along as quickly as possible with my experienced eye as oversight. Um, so yes, that is an online workbook. Um, and I see uh, Sayad, would you like to ask a question with your voice? So you've got your hand raised. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, uh, you could then ask your question with your voice. Say it, can you hear it? Can you hear us? If you can, uh, the mute button should be down at the bottom left. There you go. Hello? Hello. Uh, thank you for... Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, making me part to participate in this program. Uh, as you know, as I told you, I live in Iran and uh, uh, I recently met Mr. Mollison, Andrew Mollison. So I decided to join you in this amazing work. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, Iran is, as I mentioned in my question, is sub-desert country. So we really have shortage of water. So, uh, but the government don't, do not permit the land as I watched some videos on Mr. Mollison's 
uh, YouTube channel to work like this or to to to, to make cistern or aqueduct. So what should we do? How we can work like you? This is my question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really starts with community engagement and having the community understand um, government always changes retroactively after enough people change and after the willpower of the people changes. Um, and so I think looking at Rajendra's example in India uh, is really a perfect example of what could be done there, um, where they are not quite as dry, but pretty close. Uh, and basically just holding on to every bit of rain when it does come. Um, and, you know, in many cases, this is, it's not just in Iran, but all around the world. I mean, in the U.S. is one of the worst places as far as um, laws being in the way of doing this kind of work. Uh, and really, to some degree, we need people to start following the laws of the landscape instead of the laws of the humans, uh, get enough public will and support behind them. And that's the only way we're gonna be able to make this kind of large scale change. Uh, you look at even in the example in India, they revived seven rivers, they lowered the temperature two degrees Celsius, they brought water back to a quarter of a million wells, uh, but they had all sorts of issues from the government but then eventually with enough success, with enough pressure from the people, uh, the government made all of the issues go away. So it's it's a big ask. And I think there's ways that we can do it without raising the red flags. And those are the things that we need to do now. Um, but when you look at a region like that and how to really change it, it takes a paradigm shift within the people first and foremost. Uh, yes. Uh, um, how big is this project? For example, me, if I participate, and for sure I am participating, how big uh, the land should be? Or when should I start? Um, how should I work? Th these are the, the main fact that uh, all practitioners should know, I think. Yeah, so it's, I mean, honestly, a lot of that actually depends on you and what fits you well. Um, so it's one of the things that we go through throughout the course is helping people figure out what scale makes sense to act upon. Mm -hmm. Now, if we want to revive rivers, we need to be acting on, you know, hundreds of thousands of hectares, millions of hectares. Uh, but if we want to make an impact on a specific landscape, it can be a half of a hectare, a quarter hectare, even smaller than that. Um, so as far as which size to work on, I mean, the bigger scale we can work on, the more change we can create. Um, but in some ways, some of the biggest scale work that needs to be done is people who live in cities raising the awareness about all of this so that hundreds and thousands of people are changing their paradigm around water and what's possible. Um, so it's, it's one of the things that we help people go through during the course. I mean, really, it can be as small as a quarter of a hectare or smaller, or it can be hundreds, thousands, even millions of hectares. Um, a lot of it depends on what's available to you, what's within your circle of influence where you can reasonably make an impact and then at what kind of scale does your personality suit and your time availability um, and characteristics about yourself uh, um, can uh, uh, this ngo uh, give uh, notification so i give the government so they give us the land because you know um, most people who lives not in city in uh, for, i mean farmers they they, they will f i know in iran they will fight for a little water so because they think i we are going to steal uh, their their water so if i persuade my, my government 
they can persuade the farmers. So uh, they will cooperate. But um, in, I need your uh, written uh, notification. So I give the government, so maybe they, they um, permit me to work on lands. So uh, can you uh, give me or other practitioner notifications? Um, I mean, this is something we're trying to help facilitate the development of as a community. Um, so I would suggest posting that in the water stories community and say, you know, I need some guidelines for, um, you know, for how to do this kind of thing or for what government should be incentivizing. Um, I know it's something that a number of the people in the last course have been working on. Uh, that we're actively working on and, and helping with, but there's by no means any finished document yet. Um, so it would be a good place to chime in and, and add your voice to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Important work there. For sure. Um, is the program strictly online? Uh, uh, in no in-person meetings, workshops. So there are in-person meetings, um, or sorry, there are uh, live sessions, office hours that go along the module. Um, and so those are not required, uh, but you can, um, they're not required, but you're welcome to join. And they really add a lot of value to the course. So I, I think the people who did this last round, uh, a lot of people said the office hours made it worth it just on its own. Um, that's really a time to engage with a lot of like-minded people and also get some direct feedback or guidance from myself. Um, now they're not required. Uh, so it, it really is online and at home. Um, then with those live sessions as well. Uh, and then we are going to have in-person workshops, uh, especially this coming year, but the course will essentially be a prerequisite for those in-person workshops. Uh, so those will assume that you've already done the course, you've completed the course, and you're now ready to come together in person to a very intensive workshop where we really can dive deeply into content and we can focus on a project at hand or a consult or whatever the focus of that workshop is. Um, so this would be a really good way to really dive deep and learn more, get comfortable with the equipment, get comfortable with the process. Um, and those will essentially just be available to people who have already gone through this core course uh, and completed it. So this core course will function as the 101 to all of our future in-person uh, offerings. Um, could part of the course be completed in this session and the rest in the second session? So that you have two sessions per year. Um, yes, so that is something uh, where if you need more time, um, there will be an option at the end of six months um, now you get access to the video modules uh, for a whole year, so you continue to have access there. Um, but if you need more than six months, you want to complete certification, you need more than six months to do it, uh, you can essentially um, purchase a certification review when you are ready. So the course price covers certification within that six months, uh, but if you need longer than that to complete it, um, you have access to the course either way uh, for a full year, uh, but then you can afterwards purchase either an extension of access to that content um, or a certification review um, in order to extend your time frame. And then once you've completed the course, you get access to the course on a continued basis for those who like uh, with the alumni discount. So you get a 90% discount on your monthly membership uh, and you can continue to access the live sessions, um, the community and all of the course content, the bonus videos, uh, updates to the course content, all of those kinds of things. Um, and also 
future years office hour recordings, previous years office hours recordings, um, all of those kinds of things by continuing as an alumni member. Other questions from folks? Uh, feel free to put your questions into the Q&A, into the chat, or raise your hand to ask your question with your voice. Uh, and today is the last day to join uh, this coming up round of the course. Um, so at midnight Eastern time today, we will uh, have to close enrollment and that'll be our group for uh, this coming January. Yeah, Anthony. Sounds like you've got a question. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, loud and clear. Hi, Zach. It's been a while. Greetings. Oh, oh, Anthony. Oh. I think we lost Anthony. Um, other questions from folks? I know there's got to be some lingering question out there. Uh, well, so for those uh, still looking for more information about the course, you can access the course on the home page. Um, there's a lot more information about the course there. You can also watch the introduction module for the course. I'm going to put these all in the chat here. Uh, so if you want to learn more about who the course is for, why we've built it, uh, what you can expect as part of the course, you can watch what we call module zero, which is the introduction to the course. Uh, and that'll give you a really good feeling for how you can anticipate the course's format to be, the course's content to be, uh, and what you should bring, uh, bring with you to be ready for it. Um, you have to decide up front which level to take. Uh, no, or you, so you do have to make a decision, but you don't have to know at the beginning of the course. And in fact, you can change as many times as you like throughout the course. Uh, so you can start out on the professional level and then realize, oh, this is too hard for me. I want to scale back to the steward or advocate level or vice versa. Um, and you have access to all of the same course um, all of the same video content. So don't feel like it's this decision that you can't make up your mind. You can just choose one even at random and then move into the right one. Uh, it really is only in the required workbook actions for certification that this is important. So it's really not till the end of that six months that that becomes very relevant um, as you're uh, reaching the end of the course and looking for a certification. Uh, could you have a few more examples of the types of exercises we'll do in different modules? Um, so this changes a lot based on the modules throughout the course. Uh, so in some of these, you're going to need to look into your story of water, the water you drink, the water you use, where it comes from, uh, and also the story of your watershed, how that watershed has been impacted. Um, and then playing on that at a later part of the course, you're going to present a restoration plan for that watershed. Uh, so you're going to use all of the different pieces and techniques and strategies through the course to then put together a restoration plan for that place. Um, in some cases, you might be doing a site assessment and going through and making a concept plan for that site assessment. 
Um, and, you know, in later parts of the module for people on the professional path, you're going to then do a project estimate for that project. Uh, and you're going to have a proposal for that project. Um, so it really changes a bit based on your pathway, which one of these actions are required. Um, and then it really is designed to guide you through an experience. Um, so, for example, another thing required in the professional and advocate pathways is to give a presentation uh, in your community. Now, this doesn't need to be complicated. It can be quite simple, uh, but it's actually so that you then end up getting the work or the connections to do that professional or advocate work within that community. Uh, so we give you a presentation, uh, we give you links to some suggested videos to play, we make it really easy for you to give that presentation so that then you become a point of knowledge within that community uh, for water restoration. Um, so those are just some of the different exercises uh, that are required as part of the course. Um, as I understand, the professional path is more involved than the land steward path. Does the professional path include the information in the steward uh, class? Yes. So it's all the same content, all the same videos. Um, you have no different access to content based on your pathway. It is just which actions are required. Um, and then in addition, uh, you still have access to all of the actions. It's just certain ones are required for you to complete, certain ones are optional. Anthony, we've got you back. Let's see if... Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, my computer froze. I think it's too cold outside today. <laughs> it's cold here too. Okay, doing? well, I, yeah, I just, I guess I, I wanted to say hi too, but I, <clears throat> you've answered a lot of uh, the question that I had concerning different types of projects and the professional path. I think I'm partly already in, and then the the more uh, land steward and, and water restoration um, program or learnings. And um, as I understand, it, it's a 101 course, so it's the, the first of maybe more if we want to dig in um, and, and come to in-person uh, workshops. Uh, and, and then I, uh, concerning the feedbacks and, you know, being able to exchange on uh, the projects we're designing or, or uh, wanting to have positive in impact on, I'm thinking about, yes, the rivers, but also the lakes and the way roads are designed, which aren't, aren't always um, uh, aligned with water restoration and, and, and keeping water clean. And so um, is the, does this uh, course include these type of, of feedback concerning, you know, uh, the whole environment, including roads, rivers, lakes, and all that, and um, also the designing of, you know, projects that we would have home, uh, say, on 100 acres or more, or, or more. yeah. And then also last question as, as I have the microphone, is this the first time you give that program or uh, it's the first time it's online, but you've been giving it uh, before? I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, great questions. Um, so yes, feedback on all levels. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that's required as part of the course is to have a regional restoration plan. Um, and so again, not only is it, uh, it, can you get feedback on it, but it's actually required to some degree uh, to think about how, you know, how a civilization in that region is overlaying on top of the landscape. And then what are the ways that we can shift that and adjust it to make it, um, you know, as soft of an impact or actually beneficial of an impact as we can have. Um, so yes, absolutely. It's, um, it, there's kind of different modules which focus on different scales. Some are very focused on individual landscapes and then some open up to a more watersheds view. Um, so that's particularly in like the third phase of the course. It starts to look at water restoration at scale and the type of legal changes that are needed and things of that nature. Um, and this is the second round um, that we've done the course. This is basically a, a course that we custom designed for this purpose. Um, so it is, it is very much online, but at home. 
And it was only once we had sufficient tools to make it interactive, did we even decide doing it. Um, I'm generally very against online courses and only because this course is very unlike any other online course um, was I okay in doing this. And so we had one round uh, that is just finishing now. A lot of awesome people from around the world been really amazing to see the kind of projects that they've all engaged in. Um, and we had a webinar Wednesday, uh, which uh, you can find, which goes into some of their success stories. Um, but so this is, we just had our first in-person workshop in Italy, uh, which a lot of those students attended, but we will have one, hopefully a couple of in-person workshops in 2023 that will really start to be project focused. And so we'll have a specific project at hand, we'll come in and we'll do the work so that people can get hands on with, you know, how much of a rise to put in a dam at one point and how to work with stones in the spillway and all of those kinds of details that come a lot quicker from being on a site. Awesome. Awesome, did I get all the questions? Anything else, Anthony? Uh, no, you, you've you answered all my questions. A few things uh, popped out, but it's uh, it's exciting to, to have that kind of knowledge uh, being shared. So I, I wasn't for uh, on, online uh, either. But I guess one last question is, uh, if we want to do it in six months, uh, how, how much time do you think it's, uh, we need to have uh, for a week, for example, in order to, to do our homeworks and uh, really, uh, you know, have the proper amount of time reserved for that during our weeks? Yeah, yeah. So I'd say it's probably a minimum of five hours per week, but really 10 to 20 hours per week. Uh, is going to be a much more accurate amount of time. Um, there's some weeks that that's probably a little bit heavy, but other weeks where you're going to want all of that time. And in a lot of parts of the course, how deep you go um, is up to you. As far as doing the minimum, I think it's like two to five hours per week. Uh, but as far as getting as much as possible out of the course, which is really what hopefully all of you are, are joining to do, I think more like 10 to 20 hours per week is pretty accurate. Okay, that's that's uh, that's good information because in the, the, the planning of all this, we're, uh, I'm going to have to build a, a new barn here and uh, have a lot of projects for this winter, but uh, I wanted to see how I can fit in and the plan ahead is always uh, helpful in that way. So thanks for that. Awesome. Good to hear you, Anthony. <laughs> Good to see your smiling face too. <laughs> <laughs> um, some more questions. I've signed up for the course already. I'm in Europe and have a question about the projects uh, Nick was talking about yesterday. In case there are any projects I might be able to work with while going through the course, uh, is there some way I can find out about projects in Europe? Um, yes, so this will, um, you will actually, so it sounds like you're already signed up for the course, Anne, thank you. Um, so you'll be getting an onboarding email uh, this coming week, once enrollment's closed, and that will include um, that will include basically all the details to get started on the community um, and that community space is I think where those things have all been shared. Um, now there's the water stories community at large, uh, which that's certainly a good place to go as well. Um, there's a lot of information about different stuff going on that's happening there. Um, I'm going to share that in the chat, but even more so, for, especially for people really doing this work, there is then a private community within that uh, that is the group of people in the core course. Um, and so as part of the onboarding for the upcoming round of the course, you'll be added to that group um, and then you'll have access to all of those conversations. Um, 
it's also been really wonderful to see different groups sprout up. We have a German speaking group that meets regularly. We have a Chilean group that meets regularly. Uh, and these people are also starting to do work and projects together within their bioregion. Um, so this would be a really good way to network with other people in Europe, understand what projects they're working on um, and how to become part of them. Um, did you say there will be a workshop in Italy this summer? Uh, so there was a workshop in Italy um, just uh, about a month ago, uh, a little bit less uh, in Tuscany. Um, we are, we talked about a follow-up workshop, um, but there, we'll see if it comes together that quickly. Um, there were a number of projects that were interested in it. Uh, we are hoping to have a workshop in Italy, or sorry, in Europe this coming summer. Um, the idea would be to do a workshop in the US, in Europe, and in South America, all only for people who have graduated from the course already, uh, as basically a deep dive, dig into a project. Um, I know we'll do this in the United States. Um, Europe seems pretty likely with the number of projects that we have that are going to be happening this coming year. Uh, and in South America, there's a lot of interest, so that may get put together as well. Uh, but essentially, these in-person workshops will just be for people who have completed the course already, taken either the previous round or this coming round, um, to then be able to just dive deep into this topic. Uh, the last workshop that we did in Italy, it was a mix of people who had done the course and people who hadn't. And we won't do that again, just so that we can go a lot deeper. I think everyone appreciated it. We got tons of good feedback on it. Um, but some of the stuff was a little bit of a repeat for people in the course. Um, and so we may do things like evening presentations or really loose uh, learning opportunities around those, but then the actual body of the workshop will be for people who have already gone through the training and are ready to just step into doing the action uh, and just want a bit more experience and comfort to be able to do so. Uh, you guys are being easy on me. Hasn't been too crazy to keep up. Um, but yeah, for folks just joining or uh, that haven't asked a question yet, feel free to ask your question in the question and answer uh, directly into the chat or to use the raise hand feature uh, to ask it with your voice. Love to hear from any of you as far as uh, different questions you have for the course. And so again, today is the last day to register for the course. Uh, the next one will open up in July 2023. Um, we'll open enrollment in June and the course itself will start in July. Um, so we do this so that we can have a really nice, fun group experience. Uh, and I know from the last one, it, it really is a big part of the course is moving through it with this group of amazing people around the world. And so this way we bunch everybody up, we have them go through the course over six months all together, uh, and then we start with the next round of the course. Uh, and so we'll do two per year um, at alternating uh, times to catch people who prefer to do it over the winter or the summer or vice versa. Uh, and so we have, what, just under, just, 11 hours left to join the course. So if, uh, if it's something that you're interested in, I hope that you come join us um, and feel free to dig into the information and in share it in the chat here to get more information about the course. And it looks like we're out of questions here. Any final questions, thoughts? Now it's your moment, folks. You can either raise your hand, put it in the question and answer, or enter it into the chat. Okay, well, that seems like all the 
questions that needed to be answered. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us here. Whether you join the course or not, thanks for taking the time to explore it. Uh, I hope that you engage in the community at Water Stories. And, you know, whether you're in the course or not, there's a lot of good content. There's a lot of good information. There's a lot of awesome people to be learned from uh, and engaged with. So I hope that you guys will join us there and I hope that you'll join us in the course. Uh, and again, today is the last day to register for the full core course. So this is the really full guided experience with all the extras, with the one-on-one -on -one time, one-on-one -on -one feedback, uh, live office hours time. And so it's the, the counting down to the last hours to be able to join this upcoming round of the course. Uh, and I hope you have a beautiful day evening, morning, wherever you are around the world. Cheers, everybody.